Hi, let's start with the concept capsules. The topic that we're going to look at today is equity indices weighing methods. So we look at the various kind of equity indices that we have. So price weighted index, equal weighted, market cap weighted index, so all of those different weighing schemes. And we look at some examples of each. First, let's look at what is a security market index all about? Now remember, even though equity indices are something that we are very familiar with because we keep seeing it in the news all the time. Equity market is not the only market which has indices. So you have indices available for fixed income, for hedge funds, uh, you know, for uh, currencies, you have indices available for everything basically. Now, what is an index actually intended to do? The main point of having an index is that it is a representation of some kind of a market. So it helps the investors track the performance, risk, uh, you have ETFs which use these indices as benchmark as well. Now an index may have two different versions, so let's see what these are. We could have a price return index, that is the one that we are mainly dealing with, or we could have a total return index. Now price return index is, as the name suggests, tracks only and only the prices of the constituent securities. Whereas when we talk about a total return index, in addition to the prices, it also tracks any kind of income or distribution that is being done. So any kind of dividends or reinvestment of interest that is being done, it's going to track that as well. Now let's have a quick look at the formulas. Now the price return index is actually quite simple. So we have this formula. You have the ending value of the price return index, the beginning value, you take the difference of those and you divide it by the original uh, you know, price level of the index. Now this formula is actually exactly the same as the formula for your holding period return. So I hope you remember holding period return. So holding re period return was nothing but P1 minus P0 divided by P0. This formula is exactly the same. So remember price return index as basically holding period return, right? It's not a new formula as such. When we talk about the total return index, in addition to this return, what we do is we add another component, which is the income. So let's say if you're talking about dividends, then in addition to this, we'll add the dividend in the numerator. So we have, we're putting that as income here, but it could be in case of equity, it would be a dividend here. So for total return indices, in addition to the prices, the difference in the prices, we add the income return. Now we, we can either use this formula or we can actually use a function on the calculator as well. So if you look at your BA2 plus or BA2 plus professional calculator, right above five, the number five, you have the percentage change formula. When you go on to that, you'll see that you have an old and the new figure that you could put in and that gives you the percentage change. So that's another function that you could use. Personally speaking, I'm not too fond of the calculator function because it, it requires pretty much the same number of keystrokes that this formula requires. So it's going to take you the same amount of time you're not saving any time there. And this formula is something that you already know. It's just the simple old percentage change. So the calculator function does not really have too much advantage, but if you prefer to use that, please go ahead. All right, now let's look at the various kind of equity indices, especially here we were talking about the general security market index, which could be applicable to any kind of market, but we are right now focusing on the equity indices. So let's look at the first type of equity index. Now the first one is the easiest type of index and that is the price weighted index. Now it's the simplest type because all that you're doing is effectively you're assuming that you're purchasing one unit of every single constituent security. So if you have three different stocks, we're simply adding up the prices of all of these three stocks. So that's how you're doing it. And then you're simply calculating an average. So it's like you've invested in all the three stocks, but you're purchasing only a single unit of every single stock. So simply calculating the average opening price of the index and average closing price of the index, and you're calculating the percentage change. So it's, it can't get easier than this. So this is the simplest type of an index, but it does come with its disadvantages as well. So it's the simplest type of index, and it's simply an arithmetic average of the prices of the securities included in the index. Examples of this, are the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the Nikkei. Now let's have a look at the example. Now you have stocks X, Y, and Z. 
the prices on December 31 are given and prices on Jan 31 are given. So think of the price on December 31 as your opening one, on Jan 31 as the closing one. So in terms of holding period return, just like we have P1 and P0, it's the same concept. Now, how do we calculate the price weighted index and the price weighted return? Simply average the three prices. So 20 plus 30 plus 70 divided by three and 30 plus 25 plus 80 divided by three. So you're just calculating the average prices and then you're looking at the percentage change of that. So the price weighted index level for December is the average, which is 40. For January, that's the average here, that is 45. And you calculate P1 min uh, minus P0 divided by P0, which was the holding period return. And that, that comes out to be 12.5%. So it's a very easy index to calculate. Now, the problem with this index, however, is that whenever there is a stock split or a stock consolidation, then you need to make sure that your index level is not changing because you know that the price is going to take a hit. So let's say if you were to do a two for one stock split, then we will need to adjust the index level so that that does not change. Because if we were to go by the price, the price would theoretically just become half. So that is going to impact the index and we need to make sure that it doesn't impact. So what we do is we adjust the divisor. So it's a simple adjustment and but that is something that has to be carried out every time there is a stock split or a stock reconsolidate or stock consolidation. So that's uh, that's something that you will have to do keep doing repeatedly. Now, the second type of an index is the equal weighted index, which is also called as the unweighted index. Now, the reason why it's called as an unweighted or equal weighted is because we are not putting any special weight on any of the constituent securities. So unlike the price weighted index, which assumes that we are purchasing one unit of every single stock here, the focus is not on the number of units, not on the number of units that you've purchased for a particular stock, but the amount that you've invested. So what you do is you assume that you're investing exactly the same amount of money in every single stock. So obviously the impact of that would be that you would end up having fractional shares in a lot of cases. So for instance, if you were to assume, let's say you start with $10,000 and you have, let's say five constituent securities in an index, that means you're putting in $2,000 per security. So the dollar amount that you're investing in every single security is going to be the same. That's the reason why we're calling it as equal weighted index. So this method assigns an equal weight to each constituent security at inception. How do you calculate the weight? You simply do one divided by N. So if you have five securities, the weight of every single security automatically becomes one by five. Now the index is calculated as the arithmetic average return of the index stocks. Now examples of this, you have the value line composite average and the financial times ordinary shares index. Now let's look at it. Now let's look at an, a numerical for this. So assume the divisor is 10. Divisor is the concept that we talked about earlier. So that simply means that that is what we use to divide while calculating the average later on. Now here is the example. So you have securities A, B, C, D, and E. We've been given the total number of shares. We've been given the opening price as well as the ending price of all of these securities. Now what would be the December 31st value, which is the opening value? Essentially, we do 50 into 40, the number of shares times the opening price that gives you the December 31st value. Similarly, the ending price is 44. So what will be the Jan 31st or the ending value? That will be the total number of shares into the ending price. So 50 into 40 gives you 2000 here, 50 into 44 gives you 2200 here. And that is what you have to repeat across all the securities that we have. So you get all of these numbers here. Here you have 10,000 here. You have 10, 2, 2, 0. So that's what it's summing up to. Now, two ways in which you can calculate, which are actually mathematically equivalent. One way is that we calculate the return per stock. So instead of multiplying it by the number of shares, we're simply taking the percentage change in the stock price, somewhat like uh, we did with uh, you know the uh, the price return. But here, so that's how we calculate the price return index. 
So basically from 40 to 44, it's a 10% return that you have. So P1 minus P0 divided by P0, that's what you're doing per stock. Similarly, for stock, stock B, you have from 10 to 14, that goes to 40%, and you calculate the percentage change or the percentage return for every single stock. Once you've done that, you have these five numbers that you have here. You find out the average change. That means we divide it by five and we get 2.2% here. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is by looking at these values. So you have 10,000 here and 10,000 to 20. Remember, divisor has been given to us as 10. Now the equal weighted index level for December is 10,000 divided by 10. That gives us 1,000. Similarly, the equal weighted index level for January is 10,220. Again, we divide it by 10. So that's 1,022. And then we calculate the percentage change, which obviously still comes to 2.2%. Now, as you would appreciate, whatever divisor you use, that is going to be the same in both the cases here right now. So that's what we are assuming. So if the divisor is the same, then it doesn't really matter because both the numbers would have come out to be the same. So 2.2%, whether you use this or this, you're going to obviously get the same answer. Mathematically, it's equivalent. It's like taking the total shares common from the equations. Of course, you're going to get the same answer. So that is what your return is, 2.2%. Now, let's look at the next method. That is the market cap weighted index. Now, what is a market cap weighted index? As the name suggests, here, the weight of a particular constituent security will depend upon its market cap. How do we calculate the market cap? Market cap simply means that we take the price of the share, price of the stock, and we multiply it with the total number of shares outstanding. So that's the market cap of the security. So the weight assigned to each constituent security is determined by dividing its market cap by the total market cap. Total market cap means for all the constant securities, you've calculated the market cap and added it up together. So your weight is simply how much your market cap is in relation to the total market cap. So this is also called as the value weighted method. Now let's take an example. So assume the base value of the index is 1000. Again, we have five different securities. We have been given the total number of shares. We've been given the opening price, end price, now we need to calculate the market caps. Market cap is simply share the total number of shares that we have into the opening price. So 500 into 40, so 20,000 here. Similarly, for the ending price, we do the same way. 500 into 44, that gives us 22,000 and so on. So we calculate all of these market caps and then we sum them up together. So 156,000 here, 144,000 here. That is the total market cap across the index. Now we calculate the weight of individual constituent securities. What will be the weight? 20,000 is for security A. That is the market cap it has. But what is the total market cap? That is 156,000. So 20,000 divided by 156,000 is the weight of the security. So that's how we are calculating it. Now let's look at the return. So remember the base value of the index has been given to us as 1000. Now the beginning index value is 1000 that is already specified in the question. Now how do we calculate the ending index value? The new market cap is 144,000. The old market cap was 156. So index has actually fallen in, in, in value. So that is something which our new index level should reflect. So how do we do this? We take the new market cap, which is 144,000, divided by the old one, which is 156, and multiply it with the original level, which was 1,000, the base level, which was 1,000. As you see, it has gone to 923, which is what we were expecting because you've gone from 156 to 144, so the value has actually gone down. So from 1,000, it has now gone to 923. So that is how we calculate the market cap weighted index. Now let's look at two more weighing methods which are there. Next one is the float adjusted market cap weighing. What does float adjusted really mean? Now it's very similar to the way we calculate the market cap weighted index. In fact, there's just one slight difference. 
instead of using the market cap, we use the float adjusted market cap. Now, what does that really mean? Uh, float adjusted market cap basically refers to the free float adjustment. Free float means that instead of considering all the shares outstanding, which we do in market cap, we only consider those shares which are available for the public to trade. Now for any company, not all the shares will be traded by the public because you would have uh, interests such as, you know, the VCs or the promoters who would have some shares, plus you would have some shares which would be held by the senior management in the form of, let's say, ESOPs. So all of these shares are subtracted from shares outstanding. So you only take the free float and then multiply it with the stock price. That is something that is called as the float adjusted market cap. So stock price into the free float. So you're only taking those shares which are available for the public to trade and then you multiply it with the stock price. So that's the only adjustment. So it's just a difference in the number of shares outstanding. That's that that calculation is getting affected. Apart from that, everything else remains the same. Finally, the last method that we look at is the fundamental weighting. A fundamental weighting basically means that we are looking at one particular uh, fundamental factor and then using that to calculate the weights for all the constituent securities. For instance, we could use factors such as the PE ratio. We can use the PB ratio and uh, we would use these ratios and then base the uh, weight we are giving to one co any constituent security on how much that ratio is in comparison to the total. So that's how we can calculate the fundamental weighted index. So it attempts to give the index a value tilt by weighing constituent securities based on certain factors. It could be the book value, earnings, dividends, any of these fundamental factors basically. So that's the fundamental weighted scheme.